Okay, so I'll be talking about the infranuclear causes of diplopia. Um, and again, just to reiterate, we're talking about binocular diplopia for those that weren't here at the very beginning. Um, and so first, let me talk about intraaxial or fascicular. So that's anywhere inside the brain stem, but not the actual nucleus itself. Um, usually when you get these fascicular lesions, there's multiple uh, cranial nerves involved because you're talking about the brain stem um, and very um, tight real estate there. Um, so you get multiple deficits. And so when we look at intraaxial involvement of the third, there's a f basically four syndromes that are um, tested on OCAPs and the, I assume the boards as well. Um, and they all cause kind of um, a third nerve, an, an ipsilateral third plus something else. So Weber syndrome causes a contralateral hemiparesis. Um, that's the only one to really cause that hemiparesis. Then the other three cause some sort of uh, contralateral ataxia um, with or without an additional finding. So Benedict syndrome can cause this contralateral ataxia with or without a tremor. Um, Claude syndrome can cause just a contralateral ataxia. Um, and this last one can actually cause a supranuclear eye movement dysfunction. Um, and that can, Nagel. what's that? Noth Nagel. Nagel, yeah. Sorry, I was avoiding the pronunciation of that. You, you caught me, Dr. Degree. Um, and those are all from different areas, um, and so I've put in parentheses the spot that the pathology is most likely to occur. Um, I don't know that that's tested as much, but it's at least good to know, and so that'll be here in the PowerPoint slides if you want to see that later. Um, intraaxial involvement of the fourth, so fascicular lesions of the fourth, it's fairly uncommon, um, and it's usually due to um, some sort of compression um, on the tectum. Um, and that's usually due to pineal tumor that actually causes uh, a bilateral fourth um, fascicular lesion. Um, in that kind of context, you can also get um, basically obstruction of the sylvian aqueducts and you get elevated ICP. Um, and so you get some other um, obvious findings with elevated ICP. Um, but that's actually fairly un uncommon. Um, then intraaxial involvement of the sixth. Uh, so a lot of times it will actually include a seventh nerve just due to location. Um, and so there's two syndromes that kind of come to mind um, that combine the sixth and a seventh. Um, so foveal syndrome, you get an ipsilateral abduction deficit, uh, and then facial weakness and loss of taste, so they enter with two thirds of the tongue, and facial hypoesthesia. Then Miller Gubler syndrome. Um, is a contralateral hemiplegia with ipsilateral facial nerve palsy and then of course the abduction deficit from the sixth nerve. Uh, then if we look at kind of the next portion of the nerve, so if we move out of the brain stem into the kind of subarachnoid segment, this is where most people actually hypothesize that ischemic nerve palsies occur. Um, and so they, in this specific location for the cranial nerves that are typically in isolation, so it's usually the cranial nerve 3 or cranial nerve 4 or cranial nerve 6 without other cranial nerves involved. Um, the big things to consider in ischemic nerve palsy, so you should have the maximal deficit at presentation or at least over the next 7 to 10 days. Um, they may or may not have pain, so I know we always try to figure out was there pain involved, but honestly that isn't real predictive of whether it was ischemic or not. Um, then this is not necessarily a diagnosis of exclusion, but you should at least rule out other more significant pathology prior to this. Uh, they usually improve over three to six months, so if you notice that a lesion is progressing over two weeks or is failing to improve over a three to six month time frame, you should reconsider an ischemic um, event um, and look at more uh, maybe compressive lesions or other um, issues. Uh, then usually this occurs in the setting of known risk factors. Sometimes you're the one that identify those risk, risk factors of diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Um, and then the kind of word of warning that the BCSC likes to uh, give is just because something recovers, uh, so like when we look at ischemic uh, you know, cranial nerve palsies and they recover in three to, three to six months, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it was a benign process. Uh, so you can actually get spontaneous recovery and then um, an, 
a repeat cranial nerve palsy in, um, kind of cr in uh, tumors of the CNS is not um, an un unheard of phenomenon, so that's just something to be mindful of. Uh, then if we look at the actual third, fourth, and sixth nerve palsies, so we've talked, or I even just recently talked on third nerve palsies two or three months ago, um, so I'm going to be a little um, quick on third nerve palsies, but the big question um, anytime you see a third nerve palsy is whether it's pupil involving, um, and I've shown all of these kind of repeat drawings that Ashley's already shown, um, just so when you guys are looking back through these slides, if you want, you can see the actual uh, nerve itself. Um, so, um, when we either identify pupil sparing versus pupil involving, um, pupil sparing um, is more consistent with ischemic etiology. Uh, it can be associated with pain, usually resolves in three to six months, kind of like the ischemic um, cranial nerves that I was giving a basic outline on just a second ago. Uh, this usually um, happens in the setting of patients that have known risk factors. Um, and then, at least what the BCSC recommends, if they have known risk factors, it's pupil sparing and they have no history of cancer that you don't necessarily have to neuroimage. I would say that a lot of, uh, that's kind of controversial at this point due to the ease of imaging, um, but you can at least, um, at least from the BCSC, do that. Uh, then, if it's not in the setting of known risk factors, you should at least uh, further work this up. Um, and obviously keeping in mind that um, GCA can do things just like this, and that's something you want to be very mindful of. Then pupil involving, uh, you should basically always assume it's an aneurysm until proven otherwise. Uh, so the BCSC will actually say that you do an emergent MRA, CTA. Um, if that doesn't identify uh, an aneurysm, then you may even want to proceed with the brain angiogram, the gold standard. Um, however, imaging is getting much and much better, so a lot of these very small aneurysms are being picked up on imaging. However, that comes with the caveat that 20% of people involving third nerve palsies can be vasculopathic in origin, so you may not ever identify an aneurysm or more uh, significant pathology, it may just be vasculopathic. However, that's a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, then um, you start getting into more complex uh, issues of the third nerve, so relative pupil sparing. And all that really means is that the pupil reacts normally, um, but you only have minimal impairment of the levator or ex and or extraocular mu muscle function. So you may have um, some muscles that are still functioning and it doesn't really fit a divisional third. Uh, so in that kind of context, you're thinking of more compressive lesions that may then subsequently uh, evolve and to include the pupil. Then divisional, just think of kind of the anatomy of the superior and inferior divisions of a third, um, and uh, you can get basically kind of a split, uh, not a full third because you're getting either the, just the superior or inferior division affected. That's usually pathology in the anterior cavernous sinus. Then the thing that um, it kind of can skew things after third nerve palsies, and this isn't usually in the setting of ischemic thirds, um, is aberrant regeneration. And so this is just misrouting of fibers to produce co-contraction of muscles, not normally affected or activated at the same time. So for example, that's eyelid retraction with, a, with adduction or pupillary meiosis with elevation. Can I, just, can I just add two things? Um, of so course. relative pupil sparing, this means that the pupil is actually larger. Okay. It partially reacts. Um, right. and that's where you really get into trouble because you you look at it and it's a little bit bigger. It works. It's sort of it's sort of spared because it works, right. and, but it's bigger. And these th these are present in like a third uh, of. Um, um, people involving, partially involving um, third nerve palsy. So um, this is relative pupil sparing is the thing that really gets you into right. trouble. Do you image every single one of these relative yes. pupil sparing? Okay. Do you know how many nights of sleep I lost before I just said yes? I image them all. Him. Okay, so I just, we just image those. And then aberrant regeneration, if you see somebody who's got primary aberrant regeneration, think mass lesions, tumor, right. and 
involving the third nerve, uh, some kind of compression. Because that, if you see primary amber regeneration, it usually is related to a tumor. Right. And like I said, usually does not occur secondary yeah. to ischemic. Um, but it's kind of like another one of those board questions. You know, the, the person's lid goes up, but they AD duct, you know, type of thing. And, and it's amber regeneration, and it's usually a tumor. Right. And just to connect that word for generation to our um, lecture on pupils, what was the sign that's possible? The aberrant regeneration of pupils. What happens with a third aberrant regeneration? What, is, what sign does a pupil show? Or can show? No, well, no. I gave you a diagram last week and asked you to name causes of. So like near dissociation. Oh, yeah. So you have to connect those two. You have to think about that. Um, then going to the, f sorry, am I interrupting you? Okay. Okay, fourth so nerve fault. That we interrupted you no, no, please do. We we At any point, interrupt, Dr. DeGree. Okay. Uh, fourth nerve palsies. Um, so, usually you'll get uh, diplopia that worsens and down gaze. So, usually the patient will come in complaining of double vision while reading. Um, the ocular motility is usually normal. Um, and then we basically identify a fourth nerve, um, at least a unilateral fourth off of a three-step test and for uh, some of the PGY2s that haven't dealt with this or even just a reminder for myself. Uh, you try to identify the hypertropia, which side it's on, um, which side is it worse <coughs> in, so either left or right gaze, um, and is it worse in right or left head tilt. So for example, a fourth, a right fourth would have a right hyper that worsens in left gaze and right head tilt. Um, then just remember any of these closed headed traumas that we're seeing in the ER, uh, it's not uncommon to get a fourth nerve palsy due to closed headed trauma. Um, and that's due to the crossing nature of the actual nerve itself. Then the six nerve palsies, uh, so it's the most frequently affected uh, isolated ocular motor palsy. Um, it causes this horizontal binocular diplopia, uh, causes adduction deficits um, that, uh, with horizontal diplopia that worsens in gaze to that same side. Um, and then you can also get an ipsilateral ESA deviation. Um, most common cause, at least in the right age setting, is ischemic. Um, you can get all sorts of sixth nerves though, but that's at least the most common cause. Um, then I've already given you kind of the guidelines of an isolated mononeuropathy. Um, so if it kind of fits that profile, uh, then you can call it ischemic. Otherwise you probably, or at least do a medical workup um, if you don't have known risk factors. Otherwise, you need to start looking into other things besides ischemic. Um, then in at least what the BCSC advises, anyone under 50, so they don't really fit that ischemic profile, uh, you should consider imaging because so few of those are ischemic in origin, um, and so you're looking at other causes of a sixth nerve palsy. Uh, then combinations of cranial nerves, and this is kind of a complex thing, and I think actually Dr. Degree is talking about the cavernous sinus in Friday. maybe Friday. 3D this Friday. cavernous sinus and 3D disc. Okay, so 3D cavernous sinus this Friday. And a silver screen. <laughs> That's right, so I won't steal too much of her thunder, but when you start getting combinations of cranial nerves, you're either looking at the cavernous sinus, uh, well I guess we could back up and say the brain stem, then back into the cavernous sinus or into the superior orbital fissure. It's very hard to actually dissect superior orbital fissure and the cavernous sinus. Um, so be thinking any of these contiguous nerves, three, four, five, six, and then sympathetic nerves. Uh, if you have involvement of multi uh, multiple of those, start thinking cavernous sinus. Uh, the neuro exam is critical, especially cranial nerve exam in this um, setting. Um, because you need to identify that fifth um, palsy. 
then this uh, requires pretty um, extensive workup, uh, probably s at least starting with imaging, and then depending on what imaging shows, you may need to go to a lumbar puncture, um, depending on what uh, you th think the etiology is and the imaging suggesting. Then just two kind of things to look out for um, that are tested fairly frequently. So Tolosa Hunt, that's an idiopathic inflammatory event of the uh, cavernous sinus, um, and then CC fistulas. Um, and I've given some kind of findings with the CC fistula. I'm not really going to hound on that at this point because um, we'll run into it um, at other dates. So, okay. Um.